We all have the power to influence the terms of our mortality. We can speed up the course of the inevitable. Some of us smoke or drink. We fly in airplanes, drive cars. We may decide to surf big waves or to take up base jumping as a hobby. It's called risk. We calculate the odds and make a deal with destiny. But what about the risks that are hidden from us by companies only concerned with their bottom line? Companies that force us to contaminate ourselves and our children with dangerous chemicals, day in and day out. Companies that make us all participants in the human experiment. I was probably one of the most active people among my friends. I had been teaching snowboarding and mountain biking constantly and was in really good shape, really good health, um, wasn't overweight, didn't smoke, just really did a lot of the things that you're supposed to do to keep yourself healthy, or so I thought. I really didn't see this coming from a million miles away. Even when the doctors were indicating that the lump was suspicious, that there was reason for concern, I still thought it was gonna be benign because I had never felt better in my life. I felt great at the time I got diagnosed. You can't explain men with hormone replacement therapy, later childbirth, not nursing babies, birth control pills, anything you want to put in there, and yet you still have the same pattern. So what's going on? Hi, baby. Go ahead. Go, go, go. I was diagnosed at 37 with invasive ductal carcinoma, stage 2. My cancer wanted to move. So we threw everything at it, chemo, radiation, surgeries, mastectomy, hormone treatment, etc. Right away, somebody had emailed me a link to the Young Survival Coalition, which is a website and a support group designed for women under 40 who have been diagnosed with breast cancer. And what was interesting was to see that a lot of these women were in the same boat. They had done everything right. A lot of them were people who never drank alcohol, never ate meat, exercised constantly, and had no family history. So you start to wonder, What's the connection? Why are, why are women this young getting cancer? Why did I get cancer? Benji, you gonna go swimming? We met when we were 19, 20. I was studying pre-med at the UCLA. Now we live in Michigan, I'm in my residency. You can't explain it by just genetics, right? Genetic drift does not happen in 20 years. So there has to be some type of other factor that's going on that explains this. And chemicals are certainly one thing that's gone up dramatically in the last 50 years. So that is a good candidate. Josephine! When we were like, okay, we're ready to start trying, we had it all planned out, actually. We wanted to... It's a perfect plan. Yeah, because we plan everything. We're very like, okay, this is how it's going to work. And we thought this was the whole baby thing. We had it all planned out. And so I got off birth control, and my cycles were really irregular, you know? They were like 45 days long, you know, 48 days long, and then 36 days long, and they were all over the place. So we went in just to my ob and and um, she diagnosed me with polycystic ovarian syndrome just based on an ultrasound and my irregular menstrual period. It's been really odd because they have no idea why I have polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, but I have it and I haven't been able to get pregnant. Every doctor that we see says, oh my gosh, you're young, you're healthy, this is going to be so easy, we're going to have you pregnant in no time. We've been trying for um, about three, three years now almost. Hey kid! Hey Benjamin! Well, for me, um, autism is a family issue. I have a 12-year-old brother who's significantly impacted by autism, um, whose name is Benjamin. At 12 years old, he is pretty much nonverbal. He communicates with um, some sign language. And at 12 years old, 
you know, he's not yet potty trained, so he's, he's pretty significantly affected by his disability. We can't fully account for all of the increase by looking at changes in definition, looking at changes in practice, um, looking at age at diagnosis, accounting for all those things. There's still a big part of the rise that we can't account for at this point in time. My brother has affected my life in every way that anyone can. In hindsight, things probably would have been really different had I not had a sibling with autism. Do chemicals cause autism? Well, that's the question of the hour, isn't it? The questions don't stop there. What are the causes of the increased rates of childhood brain cancer, asthma, leukemia in children, early onset puberty, ADHD, genital deformities in baby boys, and life-threatening birth defects? All are on the rise since the dawn of the modern chemical revolution. the Middle Ages down to modern times. The magic of chemistry has fascinated mankind. This is the age of industrial chemistry. Over the last 100 years, thousands of chemicals have been introduced into our society. 80,000 chemicals are on the market in the United States. They're in everything from curtains, upholstery, and furniture to the makeup or shaving cream you used this morning your electronics, cleaners, the very materials used to build your home. 42 billion pounds of chemicals enter American commerce every day. That amount would fill up 623,000 tanker trucks. Over the last half century, chemical use in America has gone up more than 2,000%. Chemicals surround us. They are inside of us. Most of these chemicals are not tested for their safety because industry in America does not have to prove a chemical is safe before it gets onto the market. Instead, like a defendant in an American courtroom, the chemical is innocent until proven guilty. The biggest concern that I have is our astounding ignorance, really, about the effects of most of the chemicals that are in commerce. We don't even know what's in our furniture, what's in our cleaning supplies, what's in our shampoos, our body washes, our lotions, our makeup. If you're not outraged, you're not paying attention to what the hell is going on. We're doing things to our physiology that on an individual level don't seem that profound. When you take it and multiply it over millions of people over 100 years, you're talking about entire populations that have had you know, their life chances totally limited. The Environmental Protection Agency is in charge of monitoring the chemical industry in the U.S. as laid out by the Toxic Substances Control Act of 1976. When TSCA came into law, there were already 62,000 chemicals on the market which were grandfathered in, assumed safe because they were already in use. It's almost impossible for the EPA to gather enough data to remove any of these chemicals from the market because of this toothless law. There is not a requirement that existing chemicals demonstrate safety. The procedural hurdles, once we judge there to be a risk, are very high. So taking action once you know that there is a risk is um, um, incredibly difficult. As a matter of fact, the one time we tried it, we actually lost in court. In other news today, there's a setback for the government's effort to get rid of asbestos, a mineral which is suspected of causing cancer and lung disease. A federal appeals court has overturned the Environmental Protection Agency's two-year-old ban on the manufacture and import of asbestos. The court told the EPA to try again. We did 10 years of analysis and we banned asbestos. We were sued on that, taken to court, and the court overturned the ban, which had a pretty chilling effect on the agency's subsequent efforts. Today's court ruling could also make it harder for the government to ban other toxic substances. People in the United States expect us to be able to say with authority that the products that they're buying are safe, and so we're routinely in the position of not being able to provide those assurances, and that's just an awkward position to be in. It'd be sort of like if you could not find out which cars were safer. If all the accident information was all concealed, nobody knew. If you wanted to buy a safer car, you couldn't. In that kind of world, there'd be no incentive for manufacturers to develop safer cars, because they can't even sell it on the basis of it being safer. The 
time to act is now. And I'm seeking bipartisan support. And I want to get a vote promptly to help our children by protecting them from harmful exposure to chemicals. So far, it's been a tough fight, as chemical companies have every incentive to make sure this pro-industry law remains intact. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I'm Cal Dooley. I'm president and CEO of the American Chemistry Council. The ACC is the trade association of the $720 billion a year U.S. chemical industry. They represent companies like Dow, DuPont, ExxonMobil, and more than 100 others. In 2011, the chemical industry spent more than $52 million lobbying Washington. Health advocates are struggling to level the playing field against this formidable opponent. Welcome, everyone. If everybody could please take their seats and we'll get started. We are so glad that you are all here today with us. Breast Cancer Fund, American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, American Nurses Association. Now, some of our organizations have been working on environmental health issues for some time. But mostly, we've been sticking to our own respective health fields. And we will join forces to help change chemical policies to better protect public health. I am a disability policy advocate for the Autism Society. And so I work on a variety of policies that affect people with autism and their families. I get very angry sometimes when I think about the fact that I've got to work on something that makes so much sense. And I've got to convince people that we should protect people. Today, we were doing an advocacy training to learn how to advocate for safe chemicals, for chemical reform. Everybody's getting ready to go and do a lobby day tomorrow. To think about being able to go and advocate for something that might prevent this from happening to other women and little girls and you know your friends, your family, that actually feels really good. Hi. How are Hi, you? Hi, Nancy Bierma with the Breast Nancy, Cancer Foundation. How are you? Good to see you. Hi there, Marika Holmgren. Hi, Hi Hannah Carey with the Autism Society. How are you? Well, Great. You. I came through it healthy, so I felt like, okay, you know what? I can, I can do something. I can't expect somebody else to stand up and do this if I'm not willing to do it. There's a lot of money being put into a cure, which is, which is wonderful, but wouldn't it be even better if we can prevent cancer before it even starts? Great job on that. Hi. Hello, Senator. Hannah Carey, nice to meet you. Hi, Hannah, nice to see you. I'm a grandfather with a lot of grandchildren, and uh, I love them dearly, and I want them to be healthy. But one has asthma, another one has diabetes. And uh, w whatever we can do to prevent these things from happening, we should do. And that's my mission here. Where do you see this bill going? I think that we will make it. question is, when we shouldn't have to play detective to find out whether or not a product is safe or not because we learn that a group of children have become ill in a particular area. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Um, I am a breast cancer survivor. I was diagnosed when I was 37, thank you. I was very, very lucky to come through it, to be healthy, to be able to out, be out here and advocate. Um, for these issues, but there are a lot of women who aren't, and I just don't want anybody to have to go through that. There's so many thousands of chemicals that we right. haven't tested. We really don't know, and then we combine them right. and ingest them and put them on our body. Yes. I, I made a terrible assumption that if it was out on the shelves and you were putting it on your face, it was probably safe. Right. Um, and was very surprised right. that that's not that the consumers case. Consumers do think that somebody somewhere that's right is doing is protecting us from dangerous products. It's just not right. It's just unacceptable. Really, what you're advertising is, okay, roll the dice here, right. you know, lay down your money. Trust mm -hmm. the American Chemistry Council. Yeah, trust <laughs> right. the American <laughs> Chemistry Council um, and buy our product. Right. May or may not be good for you. In the early 1900s, Somebody started looking at bisphenol A as a miscarriage preventer. Researchers realized that BPA had these estrogen properties. And then we're talking about a chemical that doesn't behave like your standard toxin. We're talking about an endocrine disruptor. Plastic researchers realized that BPA also had these amazing properties in what it could do to plastic. 
it's extremely clear so you can look through it and it just is extremely shatterproof. Before you knew it, it started appearing in everything we had. It's a six billion dollar industry today. It's everywhere. BPA and endocrine disruptors are in products that we all use every day. The plastic cups that we use are in the fragrances that are in our laundry detergent or in the little fabric sheets that we put in. And these things, if they get into our bodies, many of these chemicals can actually behave like hormones. I told my editor, I really want to look into these chemicals. I want to look at the science. I want to look at, you know, the, the, the business of this. The concern about BPA really started picking up speed in the 1990s when Patricia Hunt, who is now a scientist at Washington State University, was doing an experiment on mice. She started to realize that the mice kept aborting their pups, and she finally figured out that what was happening was plastic from their water bottles and from their cages were leaching in, bisphenol A. It was actually getting into the systems of these mice. In 2007, there were close to 300 studies that found that the chemical, if put into mice, could cause these things. Once this science started coming out, the, the press started writing about it. Federal health experts report they cannot totally rule out the dangers of bisphenol A. There started to be movements, particularly by mothers, um, who were concerned about this, right? If scientists are concerned that a chemical in the water bottle of their mice is getting into mice and hurting them, why are we giving children uh, baby bottles with this chemical in it. So once I think mom started getting sort of concerned about this, then politicians started getting into it too. Connecticut is set to pass its own BPA ban. Minnesota already has, and it's all designed to ramp up pressure on the FDA. When you start talking about the European Union or the United States, there would be legislation introduced, but it never got anywhere. The plastics industry says the U.S. joins Europe, Japan, and three states that have found no reason to ban it. Why is this happening in some countries and in some municipalities, but not sort of getting at, at this larger area? So you had a government agency who's now reviewing the chemical. Studies that were put into a bibliography from them or from this one particular contract research organization, whose clients included the American Chemistry Council, you know, trade groups that have a vested interest in keeping this phenol A in. And suddenly you started realizing that these industries, via science, via lobby groups, were preventing legislation and rulings on, on the chemical that would show that there was, was harm in it. The question then becomes, are these studies, are they there just to produce doubt so that a politician or a legislative body says, this chemical is everywhere, it provides jobs, builds our economy, and there is doubt, maybe it is a bad idea to get rid of the chemical. If it is a strategy, it's a, it's a great strategy. Hello. How are you doing? Good, how are you doing? Very well. I work for the Ecology Center, which is a nonprofit environmental organization. We test things from couches to um, Christmas lights to cars to kids' toys. I'm on the environmental health team. Our team works on toxics in consumer products, and at the state level, we're really focused on safe children's products. It's about one third of children's products that we've tested do contain chemicals that can be harmful. The goal is one, to raise awareness and make sure to, that we're empowering consumers to make more educated purchasing decisions, but it's also to move the uh, market into a safer direction. Right now, if you were to go to the store and buy a baby bottle or a car seat or whatever product you're looking for, there's no way to know really which is contaminated with toxic flame retardants, cadmium, arsenic, phthalates, anything like that. Even before I really realized the connection between infertility and, and toxic chemicals, I was passionate about it. So it just re-emphasizes it. We're all exposed to so many things without our knowledge and and then they, you know, we end up with some type of health consequences like infertility or like cancer or like a learning disability. And we're like, oh, why do I have this? My doctor doesn't know why I have this. He's like, you're healthy, you're young. It just doesn't make sense. We always talked about having three or four kids or, you know, a big family, yeah, but... and now we'll just be fortunate if we have one. Tomorrow's big transfer day. We have um, two frozen embryos done at the clinic. 
that they're going to implant. This is kind of our uh, unorganized medicine cabinet, but we know what, when we're supposed to take what. Whoa. This is what you have to do to get pregnant if you're me. Before all this, we went to bed every night, and literally going to bed was, you know, good night, love you, going to sleep. And um, ever since like this whole process started, you know, there's a lot of nights where going to bed is her crying. It's kind of thick stuff, so. All right, all done. You can choose to eat organic food. You can choose to get a mattress that doesn't have toxic flame retardants. But there's really no way to know whether our furniture has formaldehyde in it or whether our coffee mugs have cadmium or anything like that. They're not labeled. And so you think that you're purchasing safer products and there's no way of knowing because it's not controlled. Hello. Hey, how are you? Good to, see you? Good to see you. Hey, Jen, how are you? Good, Good to see you guys. So, Jen, the next portion I'm going to do is just put the um, empty catheter through the cervix to make sure it passes very easily. And once we secure the catheter in place, then we get the embryos. We did the first cycle, didn't work. We did the second cycle, didn't work. So, uh, hopefully, this last time it'll yeah. work. All right. One, two, three. So you can't see the embryo with the naked eye, but you see that bright spot in the middle? That's the fluid that contains the embryo. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slowly withdraw my catheter. We'll give it to the laboratory. They will look under the microscope to make sure they both have transferred. And as soon as I hear clear, I'll be able to take the speculum out. But this was excellent. This is how you want it to be, you know, smooth transfer. It's all clear. Perfect, thank you. Best of luck. Cross our fingers and hope to hear good news in nine days. You've done everything we've asked you to do, so, and beyond, hang in there. Very silly puppy. I'm just waiting for Noah to get home. He's been working all morning, and he's getting off early, which is great. And we'll be checking to see whether the blood test results have been posted yet. Letting us know whether the treatment was successful. Who is it? Who is that? Oh, <laughs> Hi. My body is freaking out. Okay, so all you have to do is click on lab. Is it received? I don't know. But you'll click on lab and we'll see if it's there. Will it come up right away, mm -hmm. too? Mm hmm. So you said you can see if it's nope. nope, nope, you just click on if it's there, it's come up. It's negative? With me. It is very troubling to see so many uh, issues that you think sh we should learn from basically being ignored. Certainly asbestos, tobacco, lead, uh, vinyl chloride, um, you know, you can go through a few classic examples of real mistakes, of major mistakes in which we allow these industries to get away with murder. When you look at the sort of organized campaigns, that certain industrial groups mount. They're basically just playing out of the tobacco industry's playbook. A lot of industries have managed to keep their products available to the public by a mixture of deception combined with distraction. The 
public awareness of smoking as a problem really started to develop in a big way in the early 50s. And the tobacco companies got very concerned about this. And there was a meeting with the heads of all the big tobacco companies uh, called by Hill and Knowlton, which was a giant PR firm representing them. And that meeting was really the beginning of the conspiracy to keep the public confused. It's like the genome of the way the tobacco companies spread death around the world. Today's big cars, they burn premium gasoline. In 1966, the lead industry hired the same PR firm to undercut criticisms of lead, which at that time killed and seriously injured hundreds of thousands of children. This is this extraordinary epidemic that continues to this day, which has largely gone unattended. In part, it's because the industry's been very effective in propagandizing. To protect their profits, the PR firm pulled the strings to ensure that the public's perception of lead was a positive one. One of the really effective ways of doing that was to really directly market to children. Some companies used the child as its symbol that told children to tell their parents to go buy lead because it was going to improve their own life. But there's quality on the inside. There's a Dutch boy on the outside. Next, it was the makers of polyvinyl chloride, or PVC, who hired the same PR giant. Their goal was to make the public think that plastic was safe and essential to a modern society. Here's a scene that has long since ceased causing any surprise. The women folk washing dishes made of plastic, dishes that bounce when they drop to the floor. PVC is a plastic linked to cancer, as well as endocrine, neurological, reproductive, and immune systems damage. PVC makers went back to the tobacco playbook and used another key strategy, hijacking the science. The tobacco industry already has provided many millions of dollars for independent scientific research and will continue to support such research so we can learn the full facts about cigarette smoking and health. These were to be presented as being completely independent, and they just weren't. It's a kind of strategy where you either jam the scientific airways with noise by publishing industry-friendly research, or you can say, we just need more research and, and need to wait until we know more, and then we can finally act. The fact that the public remained doubtful for years about the ill effects of these products, whether they be cigarettes, lead paint, or PVC, is not a coincidence. This doubt was manufactured, bought, and paid for by industry. These tactics are still used today for BPA and many other chemicals used inside our homes. The strategy has become so prevalent, it has its own name, the four dog defense. First defense, my dog does not bite. The company denies its product is harmful. This mole is not a risk to human health. This includes discrediting the studies and scientists that point to harm. Some of which I have read is pure junk science. It's trash. When the evidence becomes too powerful to deny, the second defense comes into play. My dog bites, but it didn't bite you. At this time, industry concedes their product may be harmful, but not to worry. Average people aren't exposed to it. If a chemical is highly toxic, but used only in strictly controlled industrial environments, then the risk to public health is readily manageable. The third defense, my dog bit you, but it didn't hurt you. The industry says, all right, people are exposed, but they are not harmed by the chemical. Industry reassures people that the chemical is only harmful at doses which are unrealistic in daily life. This one is not a risk to human health at the very low levels that consumers might be exposed to. The fourth and last defense, my dog bit you, and it did hurt you, but it wasn't my fault. Finally, industry admits the chemical is making people sick but shifts the blame. It wasn't their fault that consumers used their product. It was the individual's choice. Smoking is something that people choose to do uh, for many reasons, and they have to take the responsibility of their decision to smoke. We didn't control their decision. They made the decision based on uh, a lot of publicly in available information about the danger. These tactics have ensured that the Safe Chemicals Act remains in limbo. Meanwhile, every single state in America has introduced bills aimed at chipping away at the issue, trying to prevent harm from toxic chemicals. Most of these fights have been spearheaded by concerned parents and health advocates who have come head to head with big business.
need to have some coffee. The legislature might go really late tonight. Hi Did you guys hear me? Because the legislature went to almost midnight last night. We're not going to be late for school. Love you. I'm not even on the highway yet. It gets companies to, you know, really look at what they're putting in their products and to look for safer alternatives, ones that don't cause cancer or reproductive toxicants or developmental toxicants. We are at crunch time. We have till uh, Monday to get the bill out of the Senate um, and into the House. Uh, and to be really honest, we are um, we're a few votes short. We had a number of our um, activists come down to Olympia today to talk to legislators about the Children's Safe Products Bill. The problem is, is that the chemical industry and the um, toy industry is, are getting traction around some of their arguments. And their two main arguments are, one, you know, why are we doing this now? Why are we spending money on this issue when we're getting slashed, you know, health care and slashed education? And their second argument is, this is too onerous for business. And, you know, they shouldn't have to do alternative assessments for safer all alternatives. The toy industry is, is not hurting economically and they can do these things. Are they on yet? Do you know? They go on at 10. 10. This is where we talk to legislators. Uh, they're going to be on the floor um, taking action on bills when they're voting um, all day today. So we send in notes to them and we ask them to come out and talk to us about the legislation and ask for their support. We need 25 votes. We are within a few votes. Yeah, we, we have a champion. So what'd you say? We said we want, we're here to support the Children's Safe Products Act. We know that you like this bill, we really want you to push it through the floor by the end of this week. He said, happy to. We just picked up one vote in a text message, which was awesome. Now, I totally understand we need to educate kids, but they need to be healthy first. We're still scrambling for a um, number of votes and uh, didn't make a lot of progress with one senator in particular. And it's extremely frustrating because I thought we had an opening. There's time, there's time, and there's other, you know, there's other people to talk to, so all is not lost. <laughs> Last night we made a lot of progress. Uh, we talked to one key senator and he asked for two things in the bill that we were willing to address in an amendment. So we worked on the amendment last night and this morning we started again. So I think we're pretty close on an amendment that will get this key senator's vote. And then we're within two votes. One of those votes is close. The person is getting uh, more comfortable with the bill. And if that one person goes, we know a bunch of others will come along. We're really close and it's really exciting. Feeling pretty good. We had a lot of activity over the weekend. Lots of folks in key areas calling their senators. Really powerful stuff, and I think we're going to get a vote today. It's on the list to be considered first up this morning, which is a really good sign. We don't know what happens once the bill gets on the floor, but <laughs> but we're feeling uh, pretty good this morning. The good news about that, no, I, and, I, and I understand. And I, I'm sorry, do you have, I'm sorry. Did you get permission to run that on me? It's really a few people can make the difference. You know, they can either hold up the bill or they can make it happen. So we can make progress on children's health and toxic chemicals, or we cannot because of a few handful of people.
very long-lived molecules and they are fat loving so they end up in our bodies our breast milk our body fat and they just stay there and the ones that have been studied cause health problems they cause thyroid reproductive neurological endocrine problems some of them cause cancer flame retardants in your sofa, all of our electronics that we are so attached to today. The chemicals also don't bind to the product. They fall to the floor. The danger really is the dust in the chemicals on the floor. That's where the most direct contact is. AB 706 by the chair, which prohibits certain fire retardants in furniture and bedding products. Initially, we started out attempting to ban these chemicals. One of my most challenging and frustrating experiences as a legislator for the past 13 years. So I would ask for your very thoughtful, I vote to allow this conversation to continue a little bit further. You don't want to vote for it on the floor, that's, that's your choice, but why this bill should die in its first policy committee uh, would concern me very much. I'd ask for your I vote. The chemical industry has such a lock on my colleagues in that they really do a full court press. They paid for lobbyists and for all of the newspaper ads. They did a multi-million dollar multimedia campaign against our bill. Full page color ads in newspapers up and down the state, television, radio, mailers and robocalls, urging people in California to call their state legislators to vote against our bill. And the message was, this bill will set your children on fire. These are big corporate interests, but their front is citizens for fire safety. They're promoting fire safety. They're not promoting use of chemicals. Uh, it's a lot warmer and fuzzier. We estimate that about $6 million were spent killing just one of our bills. They have endless amounts of cash. I was the only one at this table that was not receiving dollars from the chemical industry. Are either of the other witnesses in opposition paid for your time here? I'm not asking do you work for the chemical companies. I'm just asking were either one of you paid to testify for your time here in opposition to the bill? Citizens for Fire Safety. Okay, thank you. And sir? Citizens for Fire Safety are paying for my trip here, yes. Okay, thank you very much. And your time here as well? Yes. Thank you. I may author 20 bills in a year. I can't take time to go visit all of my colleagues on all of my bills. But on this particular bill, because I know of the challenge I face, for a committee hearing, I will visit every one of my colleagues who sit on that committee to make my case and to put every bit of reason and rationale in front of them to support the bill. And almost without exception, every time when I'm leaving their office, waiting in their waiting room with a smile on his or her face, is a lobbyist for the chemical industry who will get the last word. Give me a brief testimony, sir. Yes, sir. The chemical industry is very savvy, if not insidious, in how it prepares for a legislative committee hearing. And what the chemical industry will do is focus specifically on a particular member of the committee. So for example, an African-American member of the committee from Los Angeles might find three young African-American 10-year-old boys flown up by the industry to tell the committee Please don't let me burn in a fire. Ten-year-old boys pleading for their lives. So this isn't theoretical, this actually happened? I have seen this happen, yes. Hello, my name is Christopher Brown, and good morning. I'm 10 years old. I say no, don't take fire retardants away. I just want you to imagine a child crying for help in a burning building, dying when there was a person who only had to vote to save their life. Please save a life and vote no against SB 772. Imagine hearing someone you love say, I love you. And that might be the last time that you will hear them say that. So please vote no on SB 772 and keep us safe from fire. This is probably one of the more extreme examples I've had of having to go nose to nose with a lobbying firm for a particular industry. We're fighting industry all the time. and I did not think it would be this hard. Move, Bill. Uh, Madam Secretary, call the roll. 
Price? No. <clears throat> Price, no. Corbett? Aye. Corbett, aye. Correa? No. Correa, no. Vargas? No. Vargas, no. Walters? Walters, no. in retreat and uh, reconsidering what our best next step will be. We're not going away. With the PR machines of industry succeeding in quashing many political efforts, activists believe it's up to them to intervene. test Johnson's baby shampoo and it turned out to contain formaldehyde and 1,4-dioxane, uh, two known carcinogens that are contaminating the product. That was in May 2009. We did have a series of meetings with them in which they heard our concerns, but two and a half years later, uh, not only have they not reformulated Johnson's baby shampoo, we've found that they're selling non-formaldehyde versions of the shampoo in many other countries. So they already have alternatives, they just haven't bothered to provide them for the U.S. market or Canada. question just about the headline change that I want to make to the press release. Basically, just want to change it to say Johnson & Johnson agrees to reformulate globally under pressure from health groups. Who's in charge of your press today? I do have an ABC affiliate coming here. We're very happy that Johnson's released a statement yesterday after they saw our report saying that they're committing to globally reformulate their products to remove all formaldehyde releasing chemicals. So that's great news. We want to see them put a timeline to that. You say carcinogen. Are yeah. children getting cancer? There's a lot of science on formaldehyde showing that it's a known human carcinogen. And most of those studies are done on workers. They have higher exposures. They tend to be men. How do you extrapolate from that data to know what repeated exposures are going to be to a child whose body is developing, who's especially vulnerable? We're getting a huge amount of attention. There's a piece posted in Forbes. We're doing calls with Reuters and lots of TV stations have called today. So it's it's been a lot of interest. People expect that American products are the best and the safest. And unfortunately, that's not the case. We're falling far behind other countries, especially when it comes to toxic chemicals and, and chemical regulations. I'm about to head into the CBC interview. Hi there. Okay. Good. All right. Okay. I'm shutting off my phone. Where are they using the safer alternatives? We found uh, better formulations in the UK, Japan, Sweden, South Africa. All of those countries, uh, they've switched to non-formaldehyde chemicals. Why wouldn't they do it for Canada and the US? That's a great question. You know, we don't know the answer to that. We think this company's been incredibly slow to move. What evidence do you have that these chemicals have harmed babies? We know that rates of childhood cancers are going up and nobody knows why. There are lots of carcinogens in the environment and we need to really take that seriously and remove unnecessary carcinogenic exposures and I think starting with the baby shampoo. All right, now we're headed over to the Breast Cancer Fund in San Francisco and they're the, the lead group in the campaign for safe cosmetics. We hear so much about pink ribbons and needing to be aware about breast cancer. Uh, and we don't hear a lot of discussion about how can we prevent so many people from getting breast cancer in the first place. And that's the work that the Breast Cancer Fund's trying to do. Hey, hey how you doing? Hey. How's it going? Good, good, good. How are you doing? Good. What's going on? I'm just revising the action alert and uh, getting things ready to put on our website about the victory. Okay. We just uh, officially posted the statement on their website. Oh, good. About how they're phasing out the chemicals of concern from their baby shampoo. Very exciting. It's taken us two years and we're finally getting some movement on one set of chemicals. So there has to be 
a better and faster way. We can't do it one chemical, one company at a time. As industry fights to maintain the status quo, babies all over the world are being born pre-polluted. This baby was born in Northern California on November 26, 2011. At birth, blood from his umbilical cord was taken to a lab for testing. In his blood, scientists found 28 chemicals and markers indicating there are likely to be 400 more. The baby hadn't eaten food, drank water, or breathed air, but still these chemicals coursed through his veins. What we're talking about here isn't acute danger, like a terrorist attack that kills thousands in an instant, or a train wreck with spectacular video that ensures continuous coverage throughout the 24-hour news cycle. We're talking about a very avoidable cause of illness and suffering that's been handed down to the next generation. Mi nombre es María Cruz y este y yo vengo de México y este y llegué aquí en el en agosto 18 del 99. Y yo primero empecé a, a trabajar con una señora. Trabajé como por dos meses. Y ella usaba cloro y todas esas cosas. O sea, pero yo la necesidad, como era madre soltera, traía un niño de dos añitos, tuve que ir a trabajar con ella. Ok, José, agarra tu mochila. Agarra tu mochila, ponte los zapatos, corre, vámonos. Pues mis manos ahí se me maltrataron, hasta la fecha no se me han podido, pero no están igual. Ahí se hacen rasposas bien feos, se hacen con el cloro. Y aparte, como la señora este, no nos daba guantes, no nos daba guantes y tenemos que trabajar así. Ok, pon tus zapatitos, mami. Póntelos, con cuidado. Cuando iba con la señora, como él se tiene que sprayar y estás, sientes que te ahogas, te da mucha tos, sientes que te ahogas, tienes que salir o te lloran los ojos. La, yo sentía que la señora estaba abusando de mí y yo quería ver algo diferente. O sea, no pensé en ese instante mucho en los productos porque pues no los conocía. Hello, Renu. My name is Kiko and I'm calling from Emma's. This is your house cleaning service. Emma's Eco Clean started with five ladies who had a dream of having their own business. Working as a house cleaning, it is hard. These ladies here, they're really happy. They're not tired. They look fresh. I mean, because they're not working with chemicals. We only use green products. Maria, she'd been with Emma 12 years. She is so proud of her work. Hi, sweetie. Hello. Hi. A mí me daba como, como tipo alergia, no me dejaba respirar bien. Y eso, pues, no me dejaba trabajar duro. Me sentía como mal. Es mucho mejor importante los productos este, ecológicos. Yo no uso cloro. Yo no uso amonía. Para desinfectar. Para desinfectar yo uso el vinagre. El vinagre blanco así, yo lo diluyo para los baños, hasta quitan el olor y desinfecta el vinagre. Yo todos los días es, me la paso, casi la mayor tiempo estoy con los clientes que con mis hijos, que en mi familia. Estoy con ellos, con los clientes, entonces yo aprend, uno aprende a quererlos. Y la forma que los quieres es que les, los cuida su salud a ellos. El cloro es como un monstruito que tú estás, tú estás tallando, estás poniendo agua, pero ese monstruito no se quita de allí, ahí queda. Mi niña tiene nueve añitos y ella cuando nació este, le quisieron detectar asma. Lavaba normal con jabón y cloro y todo, pero a ella le salían como granitos. Y empecé a usar el, el, el baking soda para lavar y a ella ya no le salieron sus granitos. Los líquidos para tu salud, porque si tú no tienes salud, ¿cómo vas a trabajar? Son un poquito más caros, pero son mejor. 
me están ahorrando que, que al paso del tiempo voy a terminar con una enfermedad, voy a estar yendo al doctor, estoy ahorrando porque no me estoy enfermando ni me voy a enfermar. Lo que yo hago ahorita es para bien de mis hijos, quiero que cuando ellos estén grandes también hagan cosas buenas para ellos, para la demás gente. O sea, no, no pensar nomás en ellos, sino en toda la, la demás gente. Aunque sea poquita la menoría, pero se ve la diferencia. Sí. I think the key point about environmental justice is it's asking us to consider the equity of how risks are distributed in society. So it's asking us to consider um, who benefits from a certain activity and who pays the price and how evenly are the benefits distributed and how evenly is the risk distributed. I got involved in the Marin Cancer Project, which was an organization started because the breast cancer rates in my hometown have risen 60% in eight years. I read that in the local newspaper and I was really upset about it and there were a lot of people in my life that were going through cancer. I just felt this urge to step up and, and take action because I didn't want to wait around for more people to get cancer. And so I got involved with that campaign and went door to door in 2002 and conducted this survey to Marin residents asking them about the products they used, the food they ate, if they had cancer in their households, what jobs they did, all sorts of questions. And one of the questions really spoke out to me and it had to do with the cosmetics and personal care products that you use. And I was really confused. I was 12 at the time and I was like, what do these products have to do with cancer or health problems? For me, that was so scary because I was already using cosmetics. I can pretend to be a makeup artist today. Then I became one of the founding members of Teens for Safe Cosmetics, which is now called Teens Turning Green. It became the most important thing in my life just because it it's something that it's relevant every single day. I wake up and I wash my face and I brush my teeth and I put on cosmetics and take showers. And so you start to think about it and then you start to think about everything in your life. For me, it's just become my biggest passion. It's something that I want to work on until these chemicals are banned in total. Companies can put any raw ingredient into products and they're not even tested for safety. We're trying to support companies that aren't using toxic chemicals and we're also trying to advocate for legislation protecting our health. The environmental working group contacted me. They wanted to test 20 girls across the country for levels of chemicals particularly found in cosmetic products. And of course I said yes. It says here, Jessica Asoff's blood and urine contained 13 of 25 industrial compounds, pollutants, and other chemicals tested, including chemicals linked to immune system toxicity endocrine system toxicity and cancer. Five out of the six parabens tested were found in my body. Parabens are preservatives in cosmetics and may be linked to hormone disruption and breast cancer. The skin is the body's biggest organ, so everything we put on our skin is absorbed into our bloodstream. The fact that any of these chemicals is, exist in my body is so frightening, but so empowering at the same time because that's all the evidence I need to really affect change. If everyone wants to head into the theater, that would be great. For the past six years now, I've really been doing the sort of conventional, strategic change-making, panel discussions, but nothing's really changed. If I really want to see change, I'm going to have to stand up against this issue and do something that isn't necessarily legal. If anyone wants to help me put these warning labels on products, just let me know. I think I'm gonna keep sticking with secret deodorant. That's like what I've been putting them on. I wanna target the consumer that's walking into the Walgreens to buy the secret deodorant because that's the consumer that doesn't know to use a green deodorant that doesn't contain aluminum zirconium. So for that shopper that sees this warning label that says, warning, toxic hazard, ingredients in this product have been linked to cancer neurotoxicity and reproductive toxicity. Ta-da! And we put warning labels on every single secret deodorant product in the store. It's really just like the do-it-yourself type of grill action that I think works best.
That was really awesome. It just gets me so excited. I just like want to keep going. Stop the spread. Stop the spread. We are crossing the street to Abercrombie and Fitch's flagship store to protest against the toxic spraying of their signature fragrance, Fierce. It contains toxic chemicals. So we're all here standing up for our health and we're gonna make a difference. One, two, three, four, toxic chemicals, no more. What I don't like is they're spraying these chemicals in the stores. So any customer that walks in is unknowingly exposed and they target teen girls, prepubescent girls who are extremely susceptible to chemical exposures and boys, of course. I support what you guys are doing, it's Thank awesome. You. Seems like we're getting a lot of good attention. People are going like down, there's like a, this huge line to just get into the store. Some people are going down there now and just like telling them, you know, be warmed. Think about it guys, before you go in. We're all accumulating chemicals in our bodies. It's just like we're the human guinea pigs. It's the waiting game. We shouldn't have to wait to get cancer, a reproductive problem for this issue to change. It should change now. Stop the spray, stop the spray, stop the spray, stop the spray. I am currently six and a half years out from diagnosis and I do worry about getting a second cancer. I am considered high risk for recurrence. Hi. Hi. You haven't noticed any big lymph nodes anywhere? Nope. Mm -mm. When I got breast cancer, all the subsequent treatment did really close the door on any chances that I had to have kids. Okay, so when I press on your back, does it hurt? No, I mean, everything is a little bit tender. It's when I press on muscles, does it bother you? No. I don't know what my life would have been without cancer. I probably would have had kids. It came at a very high cost. I think it also made me very aware of um, the risks that young girls face. Hello, come on in. I know that I don't want to see any other women in my life get diagnosed with breast cancer. Sadly, that's simply not going to be the case. Statistically, it's one out of eight women. But when I look at the young women in my life, I look at my goddaughters, I look at my friends' daughters, I think, you know what? We might be able to reduce that number. And that's, that's a big focus for me. My goddaughter is 14 years old. We can maybe change things for her. We can maybe change that number so that her chances aren't one out of eight. She has that opportunity to change what goes into her body so that hopefully she can reduce her risk of cancer. More and more you find these water bottles that are all BPA free. Um, but the amazing thing is it's all been, it's all been market driven. Speaking with women, they are very hungry for this information. Women are oftentimes the decision makers in their families about what they're gonna be buying, what they're cleaning with, what kind of makeup, what kind of body products. They're often the ones making those decisions. And women are very hungry for the information. They wanna do right, not only by themselves, but by their children. They should be able to walk in, grab a product off the shelf, and not worry that this is gonna increase your risk of cancer. It's just pure insanity. When I have talked to people about this issue, they get it on an instinctive level, they understand it, and it's actually a fairly quick and easy change to make. And that's empowering for people. They wanna reduce any kind of risk of um, disease or disability for their children, for their family, and products one is, is one that they actually can make and can be empowered to make. So people feel good about that. After we got the negative test result, we jumped right back into the next cycle. So we went through a fresh IVF cycle right away. Hey, good to see you. Hello. How are you feeling? <laughs> Sorry, I hate that question. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like I'm doing all right. Physically, how are you feeling? I know, I'm doing fine, thank you. I'm doing well. Any bleeding? Um, there was a little bit over the last few days, but not a lot. Just a little tiny bit. Cramps? Nothing. Okay. We know you make great eggs. They look great. They act great. You know your sperm work quite well because the fertilization rate was 
superb. Mm -hmm. We know you make good embryos. Mm -hmm. The fact that we actually got to the point of being able to freeze for them is fabulous. Mm -hmm. So everything is in place. There's no way I can tell you why things didn't click, if they, if they haven't clicked. Sure. Okay. Find out tomorrow. Noah was at the hospital, and so he was able to go on the computer system and, and check the results. And my mom and I were walking around Farmer's Market when he called and told us the good news. <laughs> Ecstatic. We were just thrilled, beyond thrilled, so excited. We didn't know it was twins for a few weeks into it. I think around our eight-week ultrasound was when we realized that we had twins. Every time we had a checkup, the boys looked great, I looked great, and so everything was going really, really well. At almost 25 weeks um, along, um, I went to the hospital because I had a little tiny bit of bleeding, and they checked everything out, and they're like, you're in preterm labor, and it was like full on, here are the medications, here's an IV, and it was bed rest, you're gonna be hospitalized for the next couple weeks. It was really intense, very overwhelming, very scary. The possibility of losing both of the boys at that time was very, very real and really frightening because again, this had been a dream come true to us to have these babies and then to be so close to losing them was absolutely terrifying. Our goal was to make it to 28 weeks um, and we actually didn't. We were close, but they were born at 27 weeks and five days. Micah, when he was born, was two pounds and eight ounces, and Zachary was two pounds and 12 ounces, so they were very small. Micah cried when he was born, despite how small he was, and that was incredible to hear him cry. Zachary let out a little whimper, but they were immediately taken to the neonatal intensive care unit. Micah and Zachary were born on January 23rd. Zachary was in the hospital for three months and discharged on April 22nd. first maybe month and a half, Michael was really strong, doing great, and then he pretty suddenly got sick with a type of bowel infection called NEC. That led to renal failure, um, so his kidneys stopped working because he became so ill, so he had to go on the continuous dialysis. Micah's dialysis machine allowed him to live, and without his dialysis machine, he would have passed within days to weeks at any point. He needed that to live. But being on dialysis also exposed to him to a number of plasticizers like phthalates and, and toxic chemicals that I knew could potentially cause harm down the road. The one thing that always disturbs me when I'm taking care of a baby is how are they gonna turn out? You know, what's their neural status gonna be? You know, are they gonna have any learning disabilities? And so every day, every shift, you're taking care of a baby and you're wanting to make sure that everything you're doing is giving you the best outcome. So it's a little frustrating to think that there's other things going on in that environment that you have no control over that may have an impact on the baby's outcome. I would bring up my concerns about chemicals with Micah's care team every once in a while, just say, hey, this is something that I'm concerned about. I know we can't do anything about it because there are no alternatives, but, and they would agree. They're like, yeah, the plastics is a, a big issue for kids like Micah that are on this type of intense medical treatment that, you know, long-term. Happy Wednesday to you. Yeah, good morning, sunshine. Micah actually was unable to come home until October 15th, so he was in the hospital from January until October, came home for four weeks, and then was re-hospitalized. His little body just couldn't do it. The palliative care team came in and they said, look, you know, you can either put Micah back on continuous dialysis for a short time, enough time for your family to come say goodbye, or you can say goodbye to him tonight. And that was really shocking. We were not ready to hear that. We did not know that that was gonna happen at all. Throughout this hospitalization course, we knew that it was always possible that we might lose Micah and that his life would probably be shorter than ours. Um, 
and that there he had a lot of risk factors up against him and a lot of challenges, but we never dreamed it was gonna be this short. I think for the rest of my life, like everything I, I do will be with my good and Zachary in my heart and in my mind and at the forefront of everything that I do. Um, including my work on toxic chemicals and advocating for a safer environment. Um, and I think if I do have the opportunity to work on chemicals in a hospital setting or in medical settings, I think that will definitely be um, all about the passion and love I have for the boys and all that they went through and the deep understanding that came with our experience of knowing that medical equipment and, and devices are absolutely critical. No one's going to question that. We need them. <laughs> but the question is, how can we make them safer so they don't potentially harm babies and children as they're being helped? Hannah, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. We are bringing together um, a kind of random group of people that we know. I want to talk to them about kind of the work that I do and talk to them about ways that they can get involved in changing chemical policy and also helping educate each other. Do you know how, like, what levels cause well, these well, illnesses? Well, that's what's really or? scary is that, you know, everybody said, oh, well, it's only, you know, it's safe at the levels that you're experiencing them, but we have new evidence to suggest that BPA specifically is actually active at really, really, really low levels. Mm -hmm. BPA has been in the news a lot because it's really scary, but that's only one of literally tens of thousands of chemicals that we don't have good information about. I was the mom that did all the research on all the, all the baby bottles, and then like a year later after I finally get her off the bottles, yeah, they got recalls for BPA. I'm like, <laughs> Totally failed. It just felt like a total failure. But it's not your failure. That's the thing that gets me so angry, is you're a new mom. You have so much to be worrying about. You shouldn't have to worry about a chemical that you've never heard of, that there's no science to say whether it's good or bad at the time, and know to take it out of, know to make sure you don't buy bottles with that. And at the time, you may not have even had the opportunity to buy bottles without BPA, because it wasn't on the public radar. I mean, the fact of the matter is you shouldn't have to have a PhD in biochemistry to right. go buy products for your family. With him, we've become so, I mean, we don't even use chemicals mm -hmm. and, uh, around the house. We just use water on yeah. everything. Because of Savine and Jacob, my older two kids having autism, then my goal is for him not to end up having autism. So I'm hoping that everything that I do will help prevent it because I don't know what to prevent since there is an environmental trigger and no one knows what it is. So. Or there may be several environmental triggers. Right. So I gotta do what I can so that it doesn't happen a third time. My understanding is the chemicals that we're giving a free pass are now gonna be regulated in Europe, and yet the same companies that sell those chemicals here are having to replace them with other chemicals in Europe and in Asia. Right. Right, and uh, it's true. Europe is working on regulating these chemicals and finding safer alternatives. Um, even the Asian markets have surpassed some of our regulation for a very, very, very long time. Um, it, products were being made in China that had formaldehyde levels that the Chinese would not allow to be sold in China and were being sent here to be sold. And so we became the toxic dumping ground for places like China. When you tell right. Americans that the Chinese have better protections than Americans do, <laughs> they're shocked. They don't believe you. Yeah, they don't I believe me. I didn't believe it when I heard it. But how do we know that these safer chemicals are going to be any better in the long run than what right. we already have? Well, that's what's yeah. actually kind of exciting about discuss about changing things. So it depends how you do it, right? because we could just switch out a bad chemical for a worse chemical. And frankly, that's what's happening in the US now. We're playing whack-a-mole with chemicals. That's what we're doing. <laughs> you know, you, you bash lead down and cadmium pops up. And so the idea, what we're hoping for is chemical reform that will address that and that will provide incentives for creating safer alternatives. Conversations like this are happening all over the country and people don't trust their products. Chemical companies aren't gonna make money if you're not buying their products. It actually is kind of the swift kick in the ass that industry might need to do some innovation.
It's entirely possible to have the burden of proof on industry to show a chemical is safe and provide a body of data showing it's safe. And that if they don't provide that data, then they can't put it on the market. Or if the data they provide shows it's dangerous, then they fail that burden of proof, they can't put it on the market. That's what happens with pharmaceuticals. And if you think about it, the allocation of the burden of proof is completely determined by what kind of errors we want to make as a society. The burden of proof in the pharmaceutical case is designed to avoid catastrophic problems. In the industrial chemicals case, it's the opposite. EPA can't act unless they can carry their burden of proof, and if a mistake is made, it's to let a chemical go on the market. It can cause all kinds of problems, but it allows industry to go forward. So we are erring on the side of promoting the industrial economy in the case of toxic chemicals. Individual states are now saying no to this pro-industry way of doing business. More than 80 state bills have been passed throughout the last decade, all bills aimed at protecting our health from toxic chemicals. And in 2007, Europe moved in this direction by enacting its new chemical law called REACH. Well, REACH is a, a groundbreaking legislation on uh, the safety of chemicals. There was, of course, legislation before, but it was considered not to be very effective because at that time, basically, the authorities had to prove that the chemical was uh, dangerous for man or the environment. What we have done with REACH is we've, we've clearly put the responsibility back to the industry and said, for everything which you do, you are responsible. As an authority, we check and we provide you the framework under which you need to do your assessment. But you're responsible yourself to make sure that what you put on the market is, uh, is safe. All the companies that sell chemicals in Europe including American companies, had to work together to put a minimum package of information on the safety of chemicals together. In return for providing the data, you get a registration number, and that's a way for the inspectors to easy control. And that's where the principle comes, no data, no market. Every six months, we add to the list. Now we have over 70 substances on that list. So every half a year, between five and, and 15 substances are added. And that's what will be most visible for the people, is, is, is to get uh, these kind of chemicals out of the system. Custom Laboratories is doing chemical analysis. They are following the EU rules that they are safe and quite often they are sending it back if they are not. You have to do some market surveillance that you go out to shops and you check if everything is as it should. You actually have people going out into stores, buying the products and then testing them? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. We are often sending them to different testing laboratories and then we look at the results that they are as they should. Or if they are not, then we are, we are reacting. And how do you react? Uh, that depends on how big the risk is. Sometimes it's just that we, we tell them that you should correct this and this. And, but sometimes we also can ask them, for example, to take the you know, products back from consumers. Every week, Commission publishes a, a summary of these notifications. Last Friday was the last one, and there were 24 notifications on, on that list. We strongly believe that this is putting us in a leading role. It's also important for industry that if they can demonstrate that they are compatible with the REACH laws, they are complying with high standards of protection. So ultimately, it is also to them uh, an advantage to do that. And that's the reason why the industry, in the end, accepted these kind of hard obligations onto them, because they win back the confidence of the consumer by complying with this legislation. One should not forget that. Now, what we have seen is that um, there is a, a bigger appetite at this point in time in Asia to, uh, to copy some of our legislation. Korea is working hard on a REACH type legislation. Now we have public consultation starting in India for a REACH type of legislation. Also, China has expressed some interest in exactly understanding how our legislation works because they are also getting more and more negative pressure from their population. And we feel that's a good thing for mankind in general. So we are also willing to help other authorities if they want to move into a reach direction. 
American bill had a tough time moving forward in 2011. Behind closed doors, the chemical industry and health advocates were negotiating, but progress was slow. By 2012, Senate Democrats couldn't hide their frustration. If your objective is to defeat legislation, if that's your objective, then I understand what you're doing. But if your objective is to get legislation enacted, I don't understand what you're doing. Our objective is to see the modernization of Tosca in a way that provides the appropriate level of safety, ensuring the safety of the chemicals that are used for their intended purposes that are in commerce, ensuring that we can do so in a manner that allows this U.S. chemical industry to continue to be at the forefront of innovation. Are you advocating for our body burden of chemicals to go up over time? <coughs> That's well, just a yes or no question, Cal, and then you... Well, it's a, it's a, it's a no. Yeah. And, uh, and the issue, though, so Senator... So you're not advocating for it to go... No, okay. the, the issue, Senator, is, is that we have to have a system in place. And are place. you concerned about it? We are absolutely concerned about it. I'll be honest, I take offense when anyone would even insinuate that our industry, you know, is supporting uh, an increase in the body burden of chemicals over a period of time. Well, that, that's where we're headed right now. Where, where do you think we're headed? Yeah, this that, has been going up year after year. After this episode, the ACC ended all negotiations. With U.S. legislative action in jeopardy, innovation is taking center. Green chemistry is the way that we think about designing molecules such that they are safer. The real revolution is getting the chemists at the bench to start thinking about this problem. We want to bring together interdisciplinary teams of professors and graduate students to really approach things like how do we make newer, better plastics without creating toxic side products. We really have folks on campus that represent all of the steps that it takes to get from a lab making a molecule to uh, the public. We're still teaching chemists how to do chemistry, but we're also teaching them to talk to their colleagues who might help them with the environmental fate, with the toxicity issues. Traditionally, the Department of Toxicology and the Departments of Chemistry, they don't talk to one another and they approach the problems very differently. So there is no requirement in chemistry programs that you ever have to breach that divide. Go talk to the toxicologists. And that is unfortunate. It's something that we want to change. Part of changing that is making sure we teach toxicology to chemists in a way that makes sense. We want to focus on molecular design, how the shape of molecules, how the reactions you're doing actually interacts with these endpoints. And I think that by working together, and by really asking the questions from the very beginning, we can create from the bottom up a better starting set of materials. Do you feel optimistic? You know, it sometimes depends who I'm talking to, but if I'm talking to students, I feel really encouraged. A lot of the barriers that we've put in the way of progress are artificial. And if you just learn from the very beginning that there's no reason to separate considering function, structure, price, and all of that from toxicity, end of life, fate in the environment, then you don't have any of those barriers. And by the fact that a lot of these things actually are better for the company's bottom line in the long run. So the drivers are aligned. The argument is about how quickly, which ones, prioritization, et cetera, et cetera. Green chemistry is starting to be used in businesses across the US. In 2011, the green chemistry industry in North America was worth $800 million. It's projected to be at $2.7 billion by 2015. Industries of all kinds use green chemistry, from children's products to cosmetics. Even the building industry, notorious for its use of toxic chemicals. I work at Construction Specialties. We're a uh, small multinational. We manufacture architectural building products for uh, commercial uh, institutional healthcare predominantly. We are in central Pennsylvania. If there is a county going to vote Republican, it's going to be Lycoming County. I'm a conservative Republican. There are times when 
part of me thinks that uh, the Tea Party's making some pretty good sense. People want things that are good and healthy and safe for their children. They want that for themselves. So from a business standpoint, customer demand drives business development and innovation. And if you can approach it and understand it from the moral standpoint, my sense is you'll better understand why customers want something. We started to become involved with uh, customers saying, you've got to get PVC out of your products. You've got to make some change. Kaiser Permanente, one of the largest independent healthcare providers in America, they were one of our national accounts. And they said, you have a year to get uh, an alternative product. We don't want PVC anymore. We're pulling PVC out of our facilities. We're just not going forward with it. You have a year. And if at the end of the year, you don't have uh, an alternative product, you don't have us. We've gone through two generations. We're into our second generation of non-PVC plastic. We've spent millions but we believe we're going to get a return on that investment. We could have stayed PVC and then waited for the market to totally reject it or a competitor to leapfrog us, but we didn't. Mr. Williams. I was asked to testify on a business perspective for reforming the Toxic Substance Control Act. Broad-based adoption of these green building standards have resulted in really very well-documented and unprecedented benefits to the economy, to human health, as well as our environment. Some of the questions I, I got were, what do you mean this is gonna protect jobs? What do you mean this is gonna grow jobs? We're adding jobs. We added 30 jobs at our facility last year, 30. You can't deny that. This economy's difficult and construction was one of the hardest hit parts within the economy. I said, well, as our business grows, we hire more. And as we hire more and sell more of our product, then our suppliers have to produce more when they have to produce more, they add. The market wants these products. So what a marvelous, marvelous time where environmentalism, consumerism, and these changes can come together to make a strong America, make job growth, redefine green jobs. I came to work one morning in early 96 and uh, I was looking on the internet and I saw a post out of Germany about BPA. I'd never heard of it. And they're talking about how ubiquitous it is and cans and all that. And I said, no, it couldn't be. I owned a canning factory. I'm running millions of cans and I got BPA in all of them. I've got children and grandchildren I feed this food to. I eat it myself. And what I learned about BPA was alarming. I began the process of trying to clean up my BPA cans. And that was two years of making phone calls to canning companies. A lot of hours pursuing this, trying to get answers to the chemistry. After two years, I was told by the canning industry that there was an attorney waiting to receive my call. It was a Beltway law firm, and I asked my question. Then I was abruptly, rudely informed that the answers to the questions I was seeking were trade secrets, proprietary information, and I had no right to know about the chemistry of the food contact service that I was buying Thank God, uh, the Ball Corporation, one of the three canning companies that we bought from, uh, was willing to go retro, use the can liner for us, for our cans and lids, that was used before the BPA version. Basically a vegetable-based oleo resin that's not toxic. You know, 60s vintage. So they started making cans for us. In April of 1999, we first ran BPA-free cans. It had to do with a paternal instinct, uh, self-preservation instinct, real basic things, not the intellectual, heady, moral and ethical uh, issues, but it certainly is one. 
if there are no morals and ethics, if nobody cares, there is absolutely no incentive for any business to do anything right. The only incentive remaining, once you remove the morals and ethics, is profit. And if that's the only remaining judgment criteria employed, you get what we have in America today. We're in the midst of this kind of enormous struggle over this very long period of industry malice and industry corruption. The dishonesty behind the purveyance of the toxins is incredible. And only the tolerance of it by society allows it to go on. It does involve dislodging vested economic powers and shaking up the system and allowing the power and money to go to those that can develop safer chemicals. I think sometimes people get overwhelmed because they think they're the only one doing this or they're the only ones concerned about it. And I think that there's a strength in coming together and saying, like, we can do this together. Things have always changed because people speak out against something. Any historical movement has, moved, has worked that way. And people do need to get involved. And this is one that I am 100% sure we can win. First is just getting people to understand how chemicals affect our health and our bodies, um, and then helping them to make personal, like, small changes at home, and then getting them involved and engaged in knowing that they can make bigger changes at the state level or federal level, and just getting involved within their local communities and taking action. Over the last two days, I have described Frank Lautenberg as one of the most tenacious men I have ever met. And it was his tenacity that led him not to hesitate in taking on powerful interests that were juxtaposed to the people's interests, but to always fight on for the people he represented. In life, you often will do things and make decisions before you have absolutely nailed something down. If I gave you a glass with a clear liquid in it, and I said, you know, why don't you drink this? There's only a 6% chance you'll drop dead. I'm not 95% certain you won't drop dead. I'm only 94% certain. Most people would not drink the water. And even if I said there's only a teeny weeny little chance you'll drop dead, you probably wouldn't want to drink the water. And so I think when people are looking at the evidence out there, the correct standard is not scientific proof. It's what's reasonable. What kind of certainty do we need to know we need something to change? We all have the power to influence the terms of our mortality. So now that we know the rules of the game, together we can stop the human experiment. <laughs>